have in my hand here a book called, uh, well, Finding True Freedom from the White House to uh, the World uh, by Jenny Dent Brandt. Her father, Harry Dent, was one of the uh, White House advisors uh, during the Nixon administration. He worked uh, side by side with the late Chuck Colson. In fact, Chuck Colson wrote the uh, a comment on this book. This was, for me, very moving reading. And uh, we had a chance to uh, talk to Jenny about uh, her father and her experience and her own life. Uh, join me now as we talk to Jenny Dent Brandt. Well, we're, we're certainly honored to have with us today uh, Jenny Brandt. And uh, where are we Skyping you in from? Where are you? I am in, actually, you're, I'm Skyping from the Clemson Seneca area of South Carolina. Well, nice to have you with us today. Fascinating book, Finding True Freedom from the White House to the World. You know, I have to say, uh, as we uh, pay tribute uh, over this last couple of weeks to the late Chuck Colson, uh, he says, this was for me, very moving reading. So uh, he obviously really enjoyed your book. He read every word of it. That's what he has to do to endorse a book. He has very high standards for the books that he endorses. Yeah, well, congratulations for having him do that. Well, Jenny, your, your story, your father's story is really fascinating, to say the least. And uh, tell us a little bit about your dad first. Well, my dad was known as the man who helped to build the Republican Party in the South when there was only a one-party system. Mm -hmm. When I was a little girl in the South, everyone was a Democrat, so you really didn't have a choice. And my dad convinced Senator Thurman to switch from the Republican, from the Democrat to the Republican Party, and he built the Republican Party in the South and led it to a place of power that elected several presidents. Well, and he ended up working for those presidents. Yes, he worked particularly as a full-time salaried member under President Richard Nixon. Wow, oh, fascinating. Tell us about his spiritual journey. Well, his spiritual journey, believe it or not, came later in life. My dad was a man who grew up in the church. He brought us up in the church, and he didn't have the vaguest notion of what Christianity was all about. As I say in my book, one day he told me that the church was a force for moral good. And I was like, whoa, my dad doesn't understand. I became a Christian at age 16 through an organization called Young Life. Mm. And that drastically changed my life, and I began to grow in my faith in ways my parents did not understand. Wow. Uh, did you have a meeting of the minds uh, later on in life? You know, I was told not to have a meeting of the minds with my dad because I was the daughter, and I was told by a very wise Bible college professor, Buck Hatch, do not beat your father over the head with the gospel and argue with him. him. Live your life as a witness. And, you know, that's a lot harder. And pray that God will work in his life. Let God do the transforming. Let God make the revelations. Don't you beat him over the head. And I was about ready to get that fry pan out, but I didn't because of that <laughs> advice. That's very good advice. Very good advice. Well, finding true freedom from the White House to the world, um, what led you to write this book? In 1998, after all I had gone through with my dad, I mean, at some points he persecuted me over my faith. He forbid me to go to a certain Bible college and would refuse to pay my way. And so I faced a lot because I went in a different direction from him. And in 1998, when I got to go to Romania, and sit on the front lines with my dad and see what he had done for that country to help them to come to freedom after communism and the 50 churches that he had helped to plant and train pastors from their own country. I was so overwhelmed at the goodness of God. I knew at that point, Perry, that I would one day write a book about what God did in the life of a man that went from being a top political strategist to seeing God's mission in this world. It was a beautiful transformation. It was written in gratitude. You know, I, I think few understand the impact that your father had on Romania. I think ma many people probably do not know. Actually, the Washington Post does not really know and understand, not that we would expect them to. Mm. But after my father died in 2007, the obituaries written about him across the country were all wonderful, and they talked about his ministry and his transformation and all he did for, in politics as well. But the Washington Post only talked about Watergate, mm. and they mentioned one line about his ministry, and he spent a good 30 years in ministry, and he did help that country that was devastated by communism he helped them to come to freedom. They didn't know how to come to freedom. They were so beaten down by communism. 
You know, uh, you start your book in the middle of the Watergate uh, era and all of that. What was it like to live on the front lines of that? It's not something I would want to live through again. To to work for an administration where your family's a part of it and you love the president and his wife, and to see it all turn around and go down was very difficult. I saw many of my friends, their parents, go to prison. Some 28 men went to prison in Watergate and was constantly hovering over our door. Every time we turned around, my dad was being questioned. They were trying to get him to tell what went on and, you know, and Honestly, my dad knew nothing about Watergate, as we could later prove. But at that time, it was like at any moment, it was hovering on our door, and my dad might be going to prison, too. So they were very, very difficult days for me, for my father, and for my entire family. I, I can't even imagine, Jenny, living through that kind of pressure. Uh, when that thing began to unwind, the scrutiny must have been just un unbearable. The scrutiny was unbearable for everyone involved, and some people brought that upon themselves. You know, that's the price you pay for, you know, feeling like you're above the law. But for our family, it was particularly difficult because Perry, my mother, and the world didn't know this at the time, had already succumbed to a severe depression because she grew up in a home where she was abandoned by her dad. Mm. And then when my father was always with the president, always on the plane, always on Air Force One, always at the White House, she felt abandoned by my dad. And she was already in a severe depression. And then we got Watergate on top of it. I can remember being 17 years old, my senior year in high school, in March of 1973, turning on ABC World News Tonight and hearing Sam Donaldson say that my father and Chuck Colson had ordered the Watergate break-in. And I was absolutely dumbfounded. It was just too unbelievable for me to believe. So you thought your dad was heading to prison? I never thought he would go to prison, but my dad himself, and this is a very poignant scene in my book, where he comes in from Washington. I'm taking care of my 10-year-old brother because my mother's in a severe depression. Mm. And this has already come out on ABC World News tonight. And he flies home and he tells me, at first he tells me, I didn't know anything about Watergate, which he didn't. But then he flies home four weeks later and he says, honey, I hate to tell you this, but the president and his men, the ship is going down. And guilt by association, I may go down with the ship. And I need for you, I was 16 years old, to be ready to take over the family and to raise your 10-year-old brother. I mean, my dad was telling me this with tears in his eyes, and I'm saying, Dad, you will not go to prison because Romans 8, 31 says that God will prove you to be right if you're innocent. And he looked at me and he said, Jenny, you don't understand what's going on in Washington. God can't help me here. Now, Perry, that's when I realized that my dad really didn't, he didn't really understand the faith he had brought me up in because I believed God could do anything. Wow. Um you know, I, at what point did your dad be, knew that the president was, was done before, it actually, before he actually resigned? I mean, I hear bits and, pieces, uh, bits and pieces of this story that some didn't know up until the day he resigned. Others saw it way ahead. Where, where was your dad in that equation? You know, I don't know exactly when he knew. I, I think he knew a little bit before that. But I was at Hilton Head waitressing to earn my way through college. Uh -huh. And I was watching it on TV as President Nixon took off on that air, that Marine One helicopter. Uh -huh. And it was devastating to look in everything my family had worked for and all the sacrifices we had made for the causes of the freedom of this country and to see everything he'd worked so hard for, you know, go down the tubes because of this. It was just absolutely devastating. Now, I will tell you this, that my dad, was asked to, you know, stay on with the Nixon administration in the second term. And a lot, everyone had to turn in their resignation. They were flown to Camp David. And when he offered my dad a position in his next term after that landslide reelection, my dad said he couldn't because of my mother's illness and depression. But he took the president. He gave him the best advice anyone could have given him. He said, this Watergate is becoming uncorked, and you need to find out who did what, and you need to fire them, make it right, and you need to come to the American public and ask their forgiveness and tell them that something has happened in your administration. And I believe, my dad told him, I believe that the American public will forgive you if you will be honest and come forth. And that was one of the few times the president did not take my father's advice. 
And had he done that, it would probably the outcome been entirely different. I believe it would have because it happened with Reagan in the next term that something happened under him. Yeah. And at first he didn't quite, you know, Knew know what was going on or say it. And then two weeks later he says, whoa, this happened under me. I take the blame. I'm sorry. I'll get it right. Mm. And it saved his presidency. Um, before we take a break, uh, going back to the fact that you quoted your father's scripture, and I realize that was something later you were told not to do, but uh, you proved to be right. Did he ever come back to you and say, you know, honey, you were right? Yes, he did. It took him a long time to go through that spiritual transformation. It wasn't immediate. It took many years, and he was having an autograph. He was signing his, his books when he wrote Watergate, the cover-up in all of us. Mm -hmm. And in the book, he wrote to me, you were right all along. Wow. Um, what, a, what an incredible story. When we come back, uh, well, let me ask you this before we take a break. If your father, and I realize this is hypothetical, what advice do you think the, your father would give a president today? I believe, Perry, that his advice today would be more spiritual than political. He was such a political strategist in his day. But as he learned the Bible, he began to see that our problems were more spiritual than they were political. And I believe he would tell a president today, it's time for us to bow on bended knee, that our problems are more spiritual than they are political. We've turned away from God. We're pulling him out of everything. And more than ever, we desperately need his hand of help today. And it's not to tell everyone how to worship God. Our country has never been a country that has told people what their faith should be. But only that as a country, we were founded upon principles in the Bible. We were founded upon God and his strength has carried us through so many years and blessed us beyond what any nation has ever been blessed. And we are now pulling him out of everything. And I believe he would say that, you know, that is the biggest mistake we're making. Well, we're going to take a break. We'll come back with uh, Jenny Dent uh, uh, Bryant in just a moment. But, you know, Jenny, uh, I've had the opportunity to be in the uh, House of Representatives on several occasions. And I happened to be there for the last State of the Union address for uh, George W. Bush. And every time a president steps to that podium, above his head, about eight feet, etched in marble, is our national motto, In God We Trust. I long for the day when a president will stand there during a uh, State of the Union address, stop everything, and force the cameras to pan up and read what is above his head, In God We Trust. Wouldn't that be remarkable? It would be wonderful. I mean, honestly, I think the only thing that can really turn our country around is at this point is if a spiritual revival like the Second Great Awakening sweeps through this country from one end to another. It's, I mean, we are in that desperate shape today, and we more than ever need the hand of God. Okay. And Abraham Lincoln said it so well. You know, the hand of God is what strengthened and enriched us, yet we've forgotten him. And here we are again at that place. All right. We'll be right back with Jenny Brant in just a moment. I'm a watercolor artist, and I have to take my paintings to galleries everywhere, including the Rogue Gallery and Art Center. So, of course, I love my Subaru. I just lay down the back seat, and these babies slide right in. I used to drive a Toyota, but my Subaru has more room, is quiet, and gets better highway mileage. I'm Barbara, and that's what makes a Subaru my Subaru. Southern Oregon Subaru on Biddle Road, Medford. I love my Subaru. Hi, I'm Tim the Timinator from Four Seasons Nursery. Thank you for watching and supporting the Dove and Christian Broadcasting. Like the folks at the Dove, we at Four Seasons value honesty, integrity, and quality. So if you're looking for great garden products, such as vegetables, flowers, shrubs, or trees, come by and check us out. I'm sure you'll find the success you're looking for. Four Seasons Nursery, half a mile north of Vilas Road on Crater Lake Avenue. Medford Construction, a leader in the construction industry. From concept to completion, we will deliver to you the highest quality workmanship at the lowest price possible. Our design build team will complete your project on time and on budget. Give us a call for an evaluation on making your home more user-friendly for special needs and the elderly. For great prices without sacrificing quality, give Medford Construction a call or visit us at medfordconstruction.com.
White House correspondent David Brody. Don't worry, we've come to the rescue. Emmy award-winning veteran news journalist. This week we went into full stalking mode at CPAC and it paid off. Political analysis you can trust. Politically, you have to wonder why um, the president decided to do this. This is really a serious assault uh, on the rights uh, of religious freedom of every American. You never know when we're going to show up or where. The Brody File. Crank it up. 7.30 Friday on the Dove TV. Okay, we're back with uh, uh, Jenny uh, Dent Brandt today, and she's authored a book. Let me tell you, this is uh, really a great story, a great read. And uh, Chuck Colson said, this book was for me very moving uh, in reading it. Uh, it's called Finding True Freedom from the White House to the World. And let me encourage you to get a copy of it. It's put by uh, CLC Publications. And I'm sure you can go online and check it out at Barnes & Noble and Amazon and take a look for it. Jenny, um, fascinating stories. Your own, your dad's, being in the White House, through the Watergate era and all of that. Uh, but let's fast forward a little bit today and say, uh, and ask the question, do you think we're losing our freedoms in America. I mean, from where your dad was, with all of the mess of Watergate, America still had the soul for liberty. Today, I don't know, I don't know where our soul is. I'm hoping it's okay, but it doesn't feel good. Doesn't feel healthy. You know, Perry, I do believe that we are losing those freedoms little by little. It's like we're we're like that frog in the boiling pot, and so we don't realize. That it's happening and when I was in Romania in 2008 after my father died some of the Romanian leaders and pastors that had grown up in the underground church they said to me Jenny why are you in America going towards what we came from because we do not want to go back and I looked at them and I said you know what you're right that's a very good question we just have forgotten to appreciate the freedoms that we have and we have no idea what it's going to be like if we had to live in a country without freedom such as what the underground church lived with in eastern europe and russia and i've been in the underground church in china i've seen what life is like for them and i think we're just taking it for granted and we're thinking it's always going to be here and mm -hmm. it's not it's not if you don't stand for it you know ronald reagan said if you don't continue to stand for freedom you will one day be telling your children and their children what it was like when america was free and i don't want to be one of the grand the, one of those grandparents telling my grandchildren what things used to be like i'm a fighter <laughs> well I, th I think there's still a lot of fight left and i hope that we uh, uh, are beginning to realize that it's going to take few generations have been given the responsibility to protect freedom and we've come from World War II to where we are now in, in 2012. And this generation, where we don't like war, we are in a war. You and I know that it's a spiritual war. But now we're responsible as to whether or not America is going to remain free. So I guess, you know, what concerns you most about our government? We're going from this democracy to this government control where we're handing out subsidies and taking control of banks and car companies and everything else. Uh, what do you see to be most fearful there? Well, it's just that we are going towards that government control. And my dad, in his days in the White House and the Senate with Senator Thurmond, he fought for limited government control because that is what works. You let the people be in charge as much as possible, and you let the control go to what is closest to the people, which is local and state control. And what's happening in our country is, again, we're just little by little letting the government, every time we have a problem, we let the government try to rescue us. And this, herein lies the total problem. The government cannot rescue us from everything. And I work on the front lines of education. I'm sitting here in my school after hours. Everyone's gone home for Memorial Day weekend, and I'll soon be going home. Mm. But the, what we see on the front lines is entitlement where people just expect the government to take care of things and to provide for, for them. Jenny, being in the White House is, is really an incredible experience. And um, we're, maybe you can get us a feel. Does the president really have the last say about everything? And, and I know that he does, but how influential are all of these advisors around them? Because it, right now we're watching an administration kind of fumble around. We're beginning to wonder who really is running the, running the ship here. 
Perry, I think it depends on the administration. In some administrations, you've got a strong president who is listening to all of his advisors, yet he's making, he's taking all of their information to make the best decision. And then you've got some administrations, well, I'll take Jimmy Carter's administration. He had very poor advisors. Mm. As a result, he did not do well as a, as a, a president. Our current administration, he just has so many so many advisors and so many liberal advisors yeah. i mean that are just way off the map just like anything we've ever had before so it's just you know i'm not not really sure i know you're thinking about osama bin laden you know what they said and they went in to get him they had to convince him to do it and he almost didn't do it yeah. and here his advisors were saying do it you you have got to do this you know so it is kind of hard you know it doesn't appear that he is a very strong president and not very well experienced okay we are heading into a really a big decision and and i don't want to go political i really want to stay on the spiritual vein of things do you think that the the, the faith community in america gets the criticalness of the moment I hope that they get the criticalness of the moment. I mean, I hope that they see. I mean, I really believe if this election does not put a man in or woman or someone who is going to go away from government control and start returning the power and the control to the people, we're going to pass a place of no return. And that is what concerns me the most. I believe we're just sitting there on the edge, and we're either, we're either going to tilt one way and not be able to turn around, or we're going to start going back to giving the control back to the people. I will tell you this, when we were talking about, you know, presidential decisions, from what I've always gathered from what my dad said about the picking of a vice presidential candidate, mm. it's not really the president's pick. It is the party and the advisors around him who are saying, what is best needed on this ticket? Mm -hmm. What is needed on this ticket? And that's how a vice president, in the years my dad was up there, that's how the vice presidents were decided. Yeah, so they say it's the president's most important decision, but I never seen it his decision. I think it's a popularity contest on how to get more votes coming up to the general election. It is, and I think for Christians, that that could could prove beneficial because it could be in the ticket being formed by the Republicans now, that it may be that Romney will pull on an, an evangelical. All right. So where do you think uh, Christians are going to be? I mean, I'm hearing everything back and forth. They're not going to vote. They are going to vote in spite of the fact that uh, it's Romney and they see him somewhat as a moderate and as a Mormon. And I, you know, I don't want to be disrespectful any of those things, but I'm hoping that we see the importance of this election the least of which the faith community will get in and, and vote the right way so that we can save uh, the liberties of, of, our, of our country. I think when you look at what Mitt Romney stands for and what if I were president and if he were president, and a lot of the stance, most of the stance he would take, we would make the same decisions. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've got. We are not of the same faith. But the way that that faith plays out in the decisions that a president makes are very, very similar in this case. And you know, Christians, Catholics, evangelicals, I mean, they have a power in what goes on if they will get out and vote. I've had people say to me, I am just not gonna vote. I cannot vote for a Mormon. I can't vote for the present person in, in power. And I said, well, you know, people in Iraq would, would tell you to vote. People in the underground church in China, if they had the right, would tell you to vote. Don't take that, that freedom to vote lightly don't pout and say i'm not going to vote because you need to vote for the person that would be best in leading this country back to what it was founded on mm -hmm. people need to really get out there and exercise that that right um let me ask you about the current battle that the catholic church church is having with the uh, human uh, health and services department and it looks like they're going to litigate this uh, that's quite a stance for their faith and their belief system to me, I applaud it. I think it's wonderful. I, I would hope that we'd all get kind of a backbone like that. You know, I heard Mike Huckabee said when, when that issue came to the forefront, he said, you know what, today we are all Catholics. <laughs> because, you know, we understand that we've got to stand with the Catholics on issues like this. And Chuck Colson was a master at this. Mm -hmm. He stood on the issues with the Catholics, with, with important groups on sanctity of life, on, on freedoms and religious freedoms and so many important things. And I think this is where we need to feel like, you know, we're, 
we're like a Catholic today because we understand that this is part of their faith and they should not be told by the government what to do. And every time in the past, usually when a religious group has gone up against the government, guess who has won? Mm -hmm. yeah. The religious group has. Yeah. Now, I'm hoping that it doesn't change and we start going the other direction where the government wins every time a religious issue comes up. But, you know, in the past, when people stand for their faith because of what our country is based on, you know, they end up winning in the end. And I think the Catholic Church has a good chance of winning this. And ultimately, I believe we are responsible for our own health care, meaning by what I do, by how I take care of my body. That is the main part of taking care of my health. And when people see the government, oh, it's their responsibility, people are not as healthy. So I just don't believe in government-run health care because I believe we should all have a part in making our own decisions and taking care of our own health as well as paying some or something towards it. You know, when it's just free, people take it for granted. They yeah. show up at the emergency room every time their little finger hurts, and, you know, <laughs> that's a part of entitlement, too. I think twice before I go to the doctor and have to pay the bills. I go when it's necessary. All right. So what do you want people to get from your book? Well, I want them to see that life is more than my dad and I thought it was. Mm. I started out in the modeling field and was on my way to New York City under a modeling contract. My dad thought the greatest day of his life was the day in which he raised his right hand to promise to serve the President of the United States. And we both learned that our greatest days came after, after we bowed on bended knee to serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I want people to get an eternal perspective, as my father would call it, the big picture of what God and his plan is all about. He wants to save this world. He wants us to be working with him. He wants us to surrender to his will, not him blessing our plans. And that's where my dad and I got it kind of cockeyed, turned around the wrong way. Wow, what a story. All right, it's called uh, Finding True Freedom from the White House to the World. Jenny, what a delight. Thank you so much. Uh, your passion is just uh, it's infectious. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, blessings to you, and uh, we'll get you back soon, okay? Okay, thank you. All right, Jenny uh, 